Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of the lecture, which is plate tectonics and metamorphism. So in this section, we will be looking at five examples. So the first one being regional metamorphism that's related to mountain building. So we have the continent continent boundary. The second one will be regional metamorphism at the oceanic crust on either side of the spreading ridge. And the third one, we have regional metamorphism at a subduction zone. And the fourth one, we have contact metamorphism. So surrounding a magmatic body, so that's D. And for our last example, we will be looking at regional metamorphism related to mountain building as well, but at a convergent boundary. Let us start by looking at the first example, which is regional metamorphism in a continent-continent boundary. So you have directional pressure coming from both sides, which results in mountain building. So in this example, we have mountain building. So most metamorphism would take place within the continental crust, like the one we're discussing here. And the potential for metamorphism is greatest in the roots of mountain ranges, where relatively young sedimentary rocks are buried at great depths. So if you remember from our previous lesson, the deeper you go, the higher the pressure. So in this example, we have the Himalayan range, which is a continent-continent convergent boundary, where rocks are thrust up to great heights, about nine kilometers above sea level, and they're buried at even greater depths. So if we consider the normal geothermal gradient, and what geothermal gradient means is the increase in temperature with depth. So if we assume that this increase is about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer, then for something as deep as 18 kilometers, you can expect the temperatures to reach 500 degrees Celsius. And because of this strong directional pressure, so this strong directional pressure you can expect that the rocks would be foliated. So foliated rocks. We'll talk more about foliated rocks when we get to um, the last section of this lecture where we talk about the classification of rocks. But what you need to know for now is that because these rocks are being pushed and squished together, then the rocks that are formed would very likely be foliated. And we talked about foliation earlier. Okay, so next we'll move on to our second example, which is regional metamorphism along seafloor spreading ridges. So this is where you would find recently formed oceanic crust moving slowly away from the plate boundary. And Due to this process, water within the crust is forced to rise in the area closest to the source of volcanic heat. And this draws water back in, creating this convection of seawater. And this temperature of 200 to 300 degrees Celsius is perfect to promote metamorphic reactions that change pyroxene to chloride and serpentine. Because the temperature we discussed earlier, so 200 to 300 degrees Celsius is much lower than the original temperature at which the rock was formed, so about 1,200 degrees Celsius, this would be known as retrograde metamorphism. And both these minerals 
chlorite and serpentine are known as hydrated minerals. And this is because they have OH in their chemical formulas. And when this later gets subducted, they get changed into non-hydrous minerals. So non-hydrous, no water, such as garnet and pyroxene. And this contributes to flux melting and the cycle begins all over again. So in this region, you would typically expect to find rocks such as greenstone if it's foliated and green schist if it's not foliated. When the oceanic crust gets subducted, it is forced down into the hot mantle. And because the oceanic crust is relatively cool, especially along the seafloor upper surface, so this bit would be particularly cooler, it won't heat up as quickly and the subducting rock will remain several hundreds of degrees cooler than the surrounding mantle. And a very special type of metamorphism takes place here where it is high pressure but low temperature. And this produces an amphibole known as glaucophane. And this mineral in particular is blue in color. And this gives blue schist its name. So when blue schist continues to be subducted, it turns into eclogite. at about 35 kilometers depth. And if you continue to subduct this rock, if eclogite continues to go further down, then this sinks deep into the mantle and melts. So because of this process, if you imagine all the rocks continuing to subduct further and further and eventually melting, only a few places in the world you would find where subduction has been interrupted, you can find blue schist being returned to the surface. So the only way you would find blue schist is to have this subduction process interrupted and have the rock return to the surface. But there are only few places in the world where you can find this. So one of the places where you could find blue schist exposed at the surface is in the Franciscan complex in San Francisco, USA. So the Franciscan complex blue schist is exposed at the north of San Francisco. And if you look at this picture here, you would see that the rocks are actually quite blue. And you can probably make out a tinge of blue here as well in this photograph here. So this blue color in the rock is due to the presence of the amphibole mineral called glaucophane. The previous three examples showed examples of regional metamorphism. For our fourth example, we'll be looking at contact metamorphism, which happens near magma bodies. So magma produced at convergent boundaries rise towards the surface, forming magmatic bodies in the upper crust. These temperatures of around 1000 degrees Celsius heats up the surrounding rock, and this results in contact metamorphism because they're in contact with the rocks, so contact metamorphism. And this usually happens at relatively shallow depth. So as you can imagine, it's shallow, so it has an absence of directed pressure. It's low pressure, high temperature, because it's about 1000 degrees Celsius. And this results in a rock that normally doesn't develop foliation. So no foliation here. And the zone of metamorphism is relatively small. So it's actually just surrounding the magmatic body. 
So you can expect this to be meters to tens of meters as compared to regional metamorphism where it's over kilometers wide. So an example of this would be the magma chamber beneath Mount St. Helens and you would find contact metamorphism around a high level crustal magma chamber like this one. Last but not least, we have our final example, which is regional metamorphism near convergent boundaries. In this case, it is at the volcanic arc mountain ranges. Okay, so because we have this extra heat associated with volcanism, the geothermal gradient is steeper here. So earlier, we talked about how the normal geothermal gradient to be about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. But because we have the extra heat associated with volcanism, we have the geothermal gradient being somewhere between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So this means because we have higher temperature and higher pressure, and we also have directional pressure, which results in mountain building, that means we can have higher grades of metamorphism closer to the surface. So an example of this would be the southern part of Coast Range in British Columbia. So it's mountain ranges plus volcanoes. So regional metamorphism in volcanic arc related mountain ranges, you can get higher grades of metamorphism closer to the surface. We've had a look at five different examples to see how plate tectonics relates to the different types of metamorphisms. So now let's try to put all that information together in a single diagram. And we can do that by plotting depth against temperature. So here we have a graph of depth versus temperature and the three heavily dotted lines. So this line here, this line here, and this line here represent the Earth's geothermal gradients under different conditions. So if you remember, this is the change of temperature with depth. So in most areas, the typical geothermal gradient would be about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And what this means is that if you go, let's say you worked in a mine, and if you went down one kilometer in depth, the temperature would be 30 degrees warmer than the average temperature at the surface. So for example, if your mine was in southern Canada and you went down one kilometer and your surface temperature was 10 degrees Celsius, that means at your current depth, your temperature would be 30 degrees higher, which means that it's 40 degrees Celsius at where you are in your mine. And that is actually really hot. So taking that into consideration, this is why if you go down mines and stuff, you need to have proper ventilation to ensure the health and safety of all workers involved. So that's the typical geothermal gradient. So going back to our graph, so we have this green dotted line here. The typical geothermal gradient at about 10 kilometers deep the temperatures will be about 300 degrees Celsius. So again, at 200 degrees, uh, sorry, at 20 kilometers deep, the temperature would be about 550 to 600 degrees Celsius. Okay, but that changes if it's in a volcanic area. So in a volcanic area, Let's have a look at this line here. 
Okay, so the yellow dotted line represents the volcanic region temperature gradient. So this is about 40 to 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So if we pull this line again, so 10 kilometers deep, you will find that the temperature would be about 450 to 500 degrees. And in subduction zones, on the other hand, so our final dotted line here, if you go about, let's say, let's go at 10 kilometers, then the temperature will actually be quite low. This is under 100 degrees Celsius. So that means the geothermal gradient for subduction zones would be less than 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Okay. So now that we've discussed the different geothermal gradients, let's try and have a look at where our examples fit on this diagram. So let's go through it one by one. The first one being regional metamorphism related to mountain building at continent-continent boundary. So this is a region of high pressure and high temperature. And you can see how that matches up here. So this is example A, where it has a great depth in which the rocks are buried and a high temperature. When we look at the normal geothermal gradient. And because it has a directed pressure, you can see that the names of foliated rocks are also included here to show the different grades of metamorphism. The next example is the regional metamorphism near seafloor spreading ridges. So let's try and identify where B is. Okay, B. So this lies along the volcanic region temperature gradient. And here you will see that it is high temperature and relatively lower pressure compared to our friends here in A, where it involves mountain building. Next, we have C. So C is a subduction zone. So naturally, it will lie here where the subduction zone temperature gradient is. And as you would expect, it would have the rock blue schist being characteristic of this region. And next, we have contact metamorphism. So contact metamorphism, as you would remember, would have really low pressures because it's quite close to the surface but really high temperatures because it is surrounding a magmatic body so we have d here and last but not least least we have e which is regional metamorphism related to mountain building but this time we have volcanoes involved and therefore we have higher temperatures and the temperature gradient reflects that as well. So that's where E would be. And there you have it, all of our examples mapped out in this diagram. Okay, so last but not least, let's talk about the zones that come into contact with the typical geothermal gradient. So if you remember earlier, this is about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So it's just this green line right here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different zones that it comes into contact with. So at 5 to 10 kilometers, we have your zeolite and clays. And at 10 to 15 kilometers within the green schist zone, we have the formation of chlorite in mafic volcanic rock and very fine micas forming in mud rock. So this gives us phyllite. 
next as we move a bit further down so 15 to 20 kilometers we are getting larger micas forming and this produces schist next as we move a bit further down in depth let me try and pick a color that might stand out so 20 to 25 kilometers deep we will have amphiboles feldspars and quartzes forming nice and you can see how this all co correlates with the typical geothermal gradient so next anything deeper than 25 kilometers so this was 25 earlier anything deeper than this would cross the partial melting line for granite so when it crosses this partial melting line for granite or gneiss then and if it has water present then it will form magmatites And that concludes our lecture on plate tectonics and metamorphism. The next section in our lecture will be the types of metamorphism. So we've talked about where these happen. Now we want to talk about what kinds of metamorphism there is. So that will be coming up next. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I will be happy to answer them when I can. Okay, thank you for your attention.